survey research. What the flip is a survey? It is a self-reported measure of some characteristic political opinions, income, depression, those sorts of things. We can use surveys and experiments. For example, we might have people report their depression after being assigned to the treatment or the control group. Or we can do survey research, which we'll talk about later. So how do you construct a survey? Unfortunately, constructing surveys isn't easy. Generally, it's better to use something that already exists. Otherwise, you have to worry about reliability and validity and context effects. Context effects mean that a pattern emerges not because of the items themselves, but because of the placement of the items. For example, let's say you're taking a survey where somebody is asking, is $400,000 a reasonable price for a home? And then immediately following that, they might ask, is $40,000 a reasonable price for a truck? Now, because you were thinking about $400,000, $40,000 seems a whole lot smaller, even though for a truck, that's kind of a expensive truck. In addition, the use of fours might be confusing. We got $400,000 and then $40,000. And if you were to reverse the order, you might see different responses. $40,000 might seem ridiculous for a truck, but $400,000 might seem amazing for a house. So these are context effects. Otherwise, when constructing surveys, there are things to look out for using the acronym BRUSO. I didn't come up with this acronym, but it's a good one. BRUSO stands for Brief, Relevant, Unambiguous, Specific, and Objective. BARUNO. In other words, you want your items to be brief, relevant, unambiguous, specific, and objective. And that's all I'm going to say about constructing surveys. Once we have a survey, it is important to think about sampling. Do we just start handing out our survey to our buddies? Probably not. Why? Because then we might have sampling bias. What is sampling bias, you ask? Sampling bias means that our sample is not representative of the population. For example, let's say Fox News releases a poll, and this poll surveys Fox News readers. And lo and behold, they find there is a 92% approval rating of President Trump. Is that accurate? No. Why? Because those who read Fox News tend to favor President Trump. Or in other words, you are oversampling those who like Trump and undersampling those who don't. And so your numbers are going to be messed up. Likewise, a poll among CNN readers will be just as biased because people who read CNN tend to be a little more liberal. Let's say if we were to sample all Americans and 50% approve of President Trump, guess what? Whatever survey you do, it should probably have 50% of the people liking Trump. So that's the idea behind survey sampling. And our goal is to obtain a representative sample of the population. Or in other words, we want the characteristics of our sample to be similar to the characteristics of the population. So how do we do that? It is a three-step process. Number one, we need to define the population. And the population is the entire group that we want to generalize our results to. So you want to generalize to all voting Americans? Well, your sample better be representative of all voting Americans. You want to generalize to all teens who might commit suicide? Well, your sample better look like all teens you could possibly sample who might commit suicide. Or let's say your entire population is all humans who have ever lived or who will ever live. Well, then your sample should probably be representative of all humans who have ever lived or could ever live. That's a hard sample to collect. Once we have defined our population, then we must specify a sampling frame. We gotta figure out some way to sample from that population, like a database. It'd be nice if we had a database of our population. So is your population all Rowan University students? Then your sampling frame might be the database that contains the student information of every single student here. Or is your population all voting Americans? Your sampling frame might be the database of registered voters. And sometimes the sampling frame is easy, sometimes it's really not. So let's say your population is all suicidal teens. Maybe your sampling frame then becomes the list of clients of a particular therapist. Will this therapist be representative of all suicidal teens? Probably not because some teens don't seek treatment and some do, but they don't go to that particular therapist. So the sampling frame is really the trickiest part. You have to hopefully find an area that you can sample that is representative of the population. Number three, once we have a sampling frame, we randomly sample from that sampling frame. Remember, random sample means that every person in the sampling frame has an equal probability of being selected. That's the ideal situation. We specify a population, we find a sampling frame that is representative of that population, then we randomly sample from the sampling frame. Now, you remember when we talked about random assignment, on average, the treatment and the control group will be equivalent. That was random assignment. Likewise, with random sampling, on average, it will yield a representative sample. Now, this always bothered me, even into graduate school. How is it that a poll of a thousand Americans can generate such precise results about the entire population when the population of the United States is like 300 million? You're sampling such a small part of the population. How could it possibly be that we get accurate results? Well, think of it this way. If I were to sample one person, 
at random from the population, what is the probability they would be six feet, six inches? Well, it would be unlikely, that's pretty tall, but it wouldn't be unheard of. Now suppose I randomly sampled 20 people. What is the probability that the average of 20 different people is six and a half feet? Extremely small. Now it's unlikely you'll sample one person who's six foot six, but if you sample 20 people and their average is six foot six, that's unheard of. Now let's say instead of sampling 20 people, you sampled a thousand people. What's the probability then? Astronomical. It would be ridiculously unlikely for the average of a thousand people sampled at random to be six foot five. Sampling one is rare, but sampling by chance a thousand different people that are really tall, that's super rare. So the more people you sample, the less likely it is that your sample will not be representative of the population. If you are actually sampling from the population. In other words, this only works if you are randomly sampling from the population. If you randomly sample a thousand basketball players, for example, it's no longer unheard of to have an average of six foot five. So that is why polls work. With a thousand people, if they are randomly sampled from the population, it becomes extremely unlikely that that sample will not reflect the characteristics of the population. Make sense? But alas, random sampling is really hard to do. It's very expensive and sometimes it's impossible, but there are alternatives to random sampling. One is called stratified random sampling. Let's say we know that 76% of Americans are Caucasian, 18% are Latino, 13% are African Americans, etc. What we then do is subdivide the population based on their ethnicity. And from those subgroups, we randomly sample within those. So if we have a sample of 1,000, we would randomly sample 760 individuals from a Caucasian subgroup and 180 Latinos from a Latino subgroup, etc, etc, etc. So that's what stratified random sampling is but that too is very expensive. Another is called cluster sampling. With cluster sampling, we randomly sample clusters, then we randomly sample within those clusters. To cluster sample, we can randomly sample 20 colleges from all colleges in the United States, which is actually pretty easy to do. And then once we have our 20 colleges, then we can randomly sample within those colleges. These are various strategies we can use for sampling, but unfortunately in psychology, we don't use any of these strategies. We instead do convenience sampling, which means that we only sample those that we have convenient access to. Like we sample undergraduate psychology students or patients that happen to come into a clinic. This means that our samples are probably not representative of the population. Is this a problem? Yeah, it kind of is. That's what my dissertation was about actually and I showed that it's kind of a big deal. It's a problem people, but it is a good first step in the research process. Remember, we're looking for converging evidence across multiple studies. It would be extremely unwise and ridiculously expensive if we were to try to collect a random sample on the very first study that we do on a brand new hypothesis, for example. We might find after collecting all that data and spending all that money that it wasn't worth it, that the hypothesis was kind of useless. Well, now we've wasted all that time and resources. Instead, convenience sampling is a great first step, kind of as a pilot run or as a proof of concept. Now, after we do convenience sampling, then we can do something called purposive sampling. What does that mean, you ask? Let's say you have a new therapy for depression and you decide to test that therapy on clients at a particular clinic and it works. Wow, proof of concept. Great job, but you know that clinic is situated in a very wealthy area. So you know that your sample is unrepresentative of the population. So you next decide to intentionally or purposely sample a new sample that is less wealthy than the original sample. This is called purposive sampling. That means you intentionally sample from a specific demographic, usually because it wasn't well representative in the last study. And let's say it works there too, then what do you have? Converging evidence across multiple studies. So maybe after several studies, you conclude that it works on the wealthy, it works on the poor, it works on all ethnicities, it works on the smart and on the not so smart. Then what? Well, maybe then you are ready for a truly random sample. But if you're at study one, you're probably probably not ready yet. By the way, this may sound like lofty goals. Like, yeah, then it would take years to test just one theory. Yeah, you're right. It would take years if you're doing it alone, but you don't have to. There are initiatives out there that are attempting to crowdsource theory development. Maybe you have access to wealthy depressed clients, but somebody in England, for example, has access to depressed poor clients. And maybe somebody in Australia has access to a wide demographic. And maybe somebody in Russia has access to a population of midgets. If you all come together, imagine the strength of evidence you can gather. This is what we call the mini labs project. For more information, see the link in the description. So in summary, we often use surveys to measure some characteristics of our sample, but it's important for both experimental and non-experimental research to have representative samples. Ideally, we do random sampling within a well-defined sampling frame that is representative of the population, but we may choose 
to start with convenience sampling, then do purposive sampling, then perhaps cluster sampling or stratified random sampling, then we do simple random sampling. And across multiple studies, hopefully we have converging evidence. So with that, let's review our learning objectives, surveys, and context effects. Basically, the order in which the items appear or the context in which they appear might affect people's responses. Remember the acronym BRUSO, brief. Relevant, unambiguous, specific, objective. Three, understand the logic of sampling, that we randomly sample from a well-defined population, and as our sample size increases, we are much more likely to have a representative sample. Four, know what random sampling, and stratified random sampling, and cluster sampling, and convenient sampling, and purposive sampling mean. And finally, this is like a learning objective for everything, but converging evidence across multiple studies. Because in study one, you're probably gonna be weak in sampling, but you're going to improve that as studies follow. So with that, peace out.